Hi, this is Dr. K from My Medical School, and today we're going to discuss atrial fibrillation. Please make sure to watch all our educational content on our YouTube channel, I Medical School. If you like what you see, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Atrial fibrillation, otherwise known as AFib, is an irregular heart rhythm that can cause significant symptoms and lead to major complications. AFib is when there is an irregular pattern to the heartbeat and is described as irregularly irregular. Symptoms of atrial fibrillation vary from those that have no symptoms to those who feel tired, dizzy, and short of breath. Most importantly, atrial fibrillation can lead to thromboembolisms, which are blood clots that can result in strokes and clots in the pulmonary blood vessels. Understanding how to recognize and diagnose atrial fibrillation is key in preventing the complications of AFib. How do we diagnose atrial fibrillation? The easiest way to diagnose atrial fibrillation is simply by listening. During a physical examination, atrial fibrillation is characterized by an irregularly irregular heartbeat. What this means is that the time between beats does not stay constant, so it sounds irregular. The pattern of a regular heartbeat is illustrated here. You notice the heart sound is steady and the sounds occur in a regular pattern. Now here's what atrial fibrillation sounds like. You can hear how AFib has an irregularly irregular pattern. When I suspect someone may have atrial fibrillation, I also palpate their radial pulse. The pulse will be irregular as well, helping to confirm your diagnosis. Though we can get a great deal of information from a physical exam, it is important when suspecting any arrhythmia to obtain a 12-lead EKG. To understand how atrial fibrillation appears on an EKG, let's take a simple tracing in one lead on an EKG. As we've discussed in the past, the heart cycle consists of a P wave, QRS complex, and T wave. The SA node, otherwise known as the pacemaker of the heart, initiates an electrical impulse, which then excites the atria, or top chambers of the heart. The excitation of the atria is represented by the P wave. The electrical impulse then passes to the AV node, where it is routed to both sides of the lower chambers of the heart, called the ventricles. The excitation of the ventricles is demonstrated by the QRS complex. Usually, the QRS complex consists of a dip, then peak, then another dip. Finally, the ventricles repolarize, which is represented by the T wave. To see if the heart is beating regularly, we expect to see an equal amount of spacing from one peak or R wave in the QRS complex to the next R wave in the next QRS complex. In atrial fibrillation, there are two main features on an EKG to identify. The first feature is the lack of a normal P wave. Remember, the P wave represents the depolarization or excitation of the atria. Atrial fibrillation is when electrical impulses are initiated elsewhere in the atria other than the SA node. Sometimes electrical impulses originate near the pulmonary veins, causing multiple electrical impulses to bounce through the muscles of the atria in an uncoordinated manner. The extra uncoordinated impulses essentially cause the top of the heart to quiver and beat ineffectively. The normally flat spaces on an EKG between the various waves appear fuzzy on an EKG of atrial fibrillation. The second major feature is the irregular pattern of the EKG tracing. The spacing between each R complex, also known as the RR interval, is irregular and not equally spaced. Due to the lack of pattern in the spacing of the RR interval, atrial fibrillation is characterized as irregularly irregular. Now that we understand how to diagnose atrial fibrillation, the next step is to understand how to manage AFib. There are many nuances to the management of atrial fibrillation, but we will review the broad steps in management. One of the biggest concerns is controlling symptoms that may be associated with atrial fibrillation. There are two ways symptoms of atrial fibrillation can be managed, and that is through rhythm control or rate control. Rhythm control is when antiarrhythmic medications or procedures like radiofrequency ablation are used to convert atrial fibrillation to a normal sinus rhythm. 
Rate control is when medications like calcium channel blockers are used to decrease the rate to help control symptoms. A key point to understand is that survival is similar whether rate control or rhythm control is chosen. Two landmark studies termed AFFIRM and RACE compared the strategies of rate versus rhythm control using primarily medical management. The antiarrhythmics used in both studies were amiodarone and sotolol. Both studies confirmed there was no survival benefit to any one strategy over the other. In addition, the risk of clot formation was equal whether someone went, underwent rate or rhythm control. One key point is that in the rhythm control group, more patients were intolerant of rhythm control medications than they were of rate control medications. Typically, rate control is chosen for atrial fibrillation patients without symptoms, and rhythm control is chosen for those with significant symptoms. Currently, there are a lot more therapeutic options besides just medications for rhythm control, making medications not the only option in achieving sinus rhythm. No matter if rate or rhythm control is chosen, the risk of clot formation is the greatest contributor to mortality and morbidity with atrial fibrillation. Since the atria of the heart do not effectively contract, blood does not move very well, and when blood does not move, it tends to clot. Clots from the right atrium can lead to pulmonary emboli, and clots from the left atrium can travel and can cause strokes. Understanding every person's risk of clot formation allows us to identify those that need anticoagulation to prevent stroke. We use the CHADS 2 VASC score to decide on anticoagulation. The score is calculated by giving one point for congestive heart failure, one point for hypertension, one point for age from 65 to 74, two points for age greater than or equal to 75, one point for diabetes, two points for stroke, TIA, thromboembolism history, one point for vascular disease, and one point for female gender. A score of zero is low risk and may not require anticoagulation. A score of one is a low to moderate risk and should consider antiplatelet versus anticoagulation therapy. A score of 2 or greater is moderate to high risk, and these patients should be anticoagulated. Despite someone's risk, one needs to consider the risk of bleeding with these medications, and any risks should be addressed so anticoagulation can be started. The choice of anticoagulation is not always clear. For those with a low risk, we typically choose aspirin therapy as a preventative measure, though the evidence supporting this practice is sparse. For those with a moderate risk to high risk that require anticoagulation, we would traditionally use Coumadin, otherwise known as Warfarin. The difficulty with Warfarin is that it needs to be monitored with blood draws to check an INR. An INR tells us how thick or thin the blood is, and we typically keep it in the range of 2 to 3 for atrial fibrillation. In addition to frequent lab draws, many foods can decrease the effectiveness of Coumadin. Warfarin or Coumadin is a vitamin K antagonist, meaning it blocks the effects of vitamin K. Vitamin K acts as a cofactor for many proteins in the coagulation system, and vitamin K is needed for the coagulation pathway to work properly. Foods high in vitamin K reverse Coumadin's effectiveness, making it difficult at times to manage the Coumadin dose. Thankfully, new agents have developed called direct oral anticoagulants, like Xarelto or Eliquis. These agents do not require monitoring, so no blood work is required, and foods do not interfere with their effectiveness. These new agents are as equally effective as warfarin and have similar bleeding rates, making them the new first-line therapies for anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. For healthcare practitioners completing a thorough physical exam, identifying whether rate control or rhythm control is the best strategy, and choosing the appropriate anticoagulation based on risk are important steps in managing atrial fibrillation. If you are concerned that you may have atrial fibrillation, talk with a qualified healthcare professional so that medications can be started to control your symptoms and your risk of clot formation is appropriately managed. Well, that was a brief review of atrial fibrillation. If you like our videos, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. If you have any suggestions for future videos, leave suggestions in the comments down below or message me on Twitter or Facebook. This is Dr. K, 
and I'll see you next time.